Welcome to the Hermitage Worship Service. This is the service for Sunday, October 11th, the 19th Sunday after Pentecost. As we continue our journey through the book of Exodus, we will talk about how the people of the Israelites became afraid Moses would not return from the top mountaintop where he was, where he was uh, talking with God and receiving the law and the Ten Commandments. And so they fashioned a golden calf and worshiped it, incurring God's wrath. I am Reverend Kathy Howell, the chaplain of the Hermitage. Our prelude is Great is Thy Faithfulness performed by Betty Cooley, the pianist for our hermitage worship. so glad you could join us for this worship service today. Let us continue our worship by reading from Psalms 106. We're continuing a study of the book of Exodus and we've nearly reached the end. And this Psalm of course recounts what we will learn about in our reading today. They made a calf at Horeb and worshiped a cast image. They exchanged the glory of God for the image of an ox that eats grass. They forgot God, their savior, who had done great things in Egypt and wondrous works in the land of Ham and awesome deeds by the Red Sea. Therefore, the Lord said he would destroy them had not Moses his chosen one, stood in the breach before him to turn away his wrath from destroying the Israelites. Our opening hymn is going to be There's a Wideness in God's Mercy. Excuse me, I've changed that hymn. The opening hymn is going to be O oh, Worship the King. Yeah. 
This is the time where we bring up our joys and our concerns. Of course, my big joy is that uh, on Monday I was uh, released from a 14-day quarantine. I had an, uh, an exposure, but it turned out that uh, I did not get sick. I was wearing a simple mask, and it did offer me, I guess, enough protection. And uh, I never got sick, and I tested negative before I came back to work on Monday. So, uh, But I am so glad to be able to see you in the halls, and I visited with some of you in the dining room or in your room, and what a joy. What a joy indeed. So I want to ask for prayers for um, my friend Clara Canistra. She's really having a rough time with things. Clara's 99, and she's on hospice care, and she is a neighbor of mine, and I've been, uh, I'm one of her POAs, so uh, I, I ask you to keep her in prayer. I also want to ask for prayers for our own, for my sister, as she continues to recover from breast cancer surgery and also for some friend, a couple who are dear friends of mine and he's having a lot of health problems. Their name are Chris and Gary. We want to pray for Judith Fisher. She continues to be out uh, and uh, she'd gone to the hospital, though I think she's in rehab now. I'll have to check with her brother. And then Saunders Miller, uh, who lives in health care, uh, he's also in the hospital. As I announced last week, uh, sort of in an addendum to the service, Nancy Rosenberg passed away. And we want to, she's our longtime member of 19 years. I think she was, she was the resident who had lived here the longest at that time. And she'd been a very active, visible part of our community, serving coffee at coffee hour and being involved in a lot of different things. So, and she loved her dolls and her rooster collection and uh, she will be missed. So let's keep her family and all those who will miss, mourn her loss, including our own community. We want to pray for all our military uh, especially, and, their, and their families, especially uh, those who are serving overseas, and for Joseph Bixler, who's the grandson of Peg Bixler. We'll keep him in prayer. Uh, we pray that for it appears that the uh, coronavirus is is making a second surge in many parts of our country. And of course, the flu uh, season is upon us. People, it is also getting colder. People will go indoors and it's harder to socially distance. And so we just need to pray that that's for the safety and the well-being of everyone, not only in our nation, but in the world from this pandemic, and also for the continued development of, uh, of improved treatments that are available to everyone and also uh, a vaccine. We, all, we want to pray for victims of natural disasters like the fires in California and more hurricanes uh, in the south and uh, uh, in the south and even up into the, uh, the, the middle of our nation and into the uh, into the East Coast. And we also want to pray for discernment. This is such a difficult and contentious time. And we pray for unity in our nation, for uh, discernment in our leaders. And we pray that God will speak to the hearts of every citizen and will open them to the path, show them the path before that he desires our nation to trod. So let us pray. Lord God, I ask your blessing upon us, and we thank you for the many things in our life. I thank you for having been spared from COVID, even though I had an exposure. And we pray, we thank you for the continued uh, safety of our community in general. We ask you, Lord, to bless and protect all who live here all their loved ones, all their family, and their family members, whether they're near or far, those who work here, and their loved ones and family members. We pray for all those who serve in, in essential services, for those in, uh, who provide the necessary, who provide health care or necessary services to keep our lives going, or, and for those in law enforcement and in 
other helping professions. We pray for all of them. We pray too, Lord, for our teachers and the students as they try to struggle and their parents and family members as they deal with the challenges of continuing education in this COVID environment. We pray for the day when COVID will be a thing of our, of our past. Uh, we ask for continued protection, for advancement in treatment, for availability of treatment to all people, for uh, consciousness of prevention and for and a practice of that. And we pray too that a vaccine will be safe and readily and, and soon available to meet the, to protect uh, our entire population and the population of the world. We also pray for our nation in this time of discernment. There's been so much uh, division and upheaval and injustice and all these things need to be addressed along with the many problems our nation has. We pray for those who are suffering from unemployment. Uh, we just, Lord, ask your guidance and wisdom as our citizens within this next 20 so or so days uh, go to the polls and vote. Speak to their hearts, Lord, and guide us all in the path you would have us trod. And speak to our leaders, Lord, and guide them. We ask these things as we pray the prayer that Jesus Christ, our Savior, taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our next hymn will be Rescue the Perishing. Rescue the perishing. Scripture reading today comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 32. When the people saw that Moses delayed from coming down from the mountain, uh, this is after Jesus, I mean after Moses, excuse me, after Moses had received the Ten Commandments and was receiving all the laws from God. The people gathered around Aaron and said to him, Come, make gods for us. Who shall go before us, for this Moses, the man who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Aaron said to them, Take off the gold rings that are on the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. 
So they all took off the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took the gold from them and formed a mold and cast an image of a calf and said to them, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a festival to the Lord. They rose early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought sacrifices of well-being. And the people sat down, down to eat and drink and rose up to revel. Oh boy, this is bad news, isn't it? Aaron has given in to the, to the pressure and the panic of the people. Instead of continuing to hold to, what, to God and have faith in God and, tr and uh, to know that his brother Moses is safe and that he will come back, and instead of encouraging the people to, be, to remain true, after all, they heard God's voice only a short time before, a few days. Moses has been up on the mountain and they're worried. They've seen, you know, clouds, and they'd seen lightning and smoke on top of the mountain. And I think they were afraid that Rose, Moses had died, and they didn't know what they were going to do. So they turned to Aaron. Aaron has been working with Moses ever since he returned from from uh, the land of Midian, after God had appeared to him in the burning bush. Moses knew the power, I mean, uh, Aaron knew the power of God just as Moses did, though it was, though God spoke to Moses and Moses spoke to Aaron. But he gives in to the pressure of what the people want. The people are afraid. They're afraid they're out in the desert and that Moses isn't coming back. They've lost faith. They're trembling. They're frightened. So they turn to their, their leader, Aaron, and instead of giving them what they need, which is encouragement and displaying confidence and faith in God and faith that, that uh, God will, will complete what he said he would do and send Moses back to them to lead them on to the promised land, he gives in to the pressure. They want what they know, what they've known in Egypt. They've, it's been 400 years since Jacob brought his family into Egypt. And all that time, they lived among the Egyptians who worshiped idols, who saw idols as their God. So they wanted something they could, they wanted what was comfortable, they wanted what they knew. And so they asked, him to make them an idol. And he did. And when the idol was complete, they said, they said, these are the, this is the God of Israel who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And instead of Aaron correcting them, reminding them of the commandment they had heard from the mouth of God, I am the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not have strange gods before me. What did they do? What did he do? He built an altar. He went ahead and tried to calm the people. Instead of telling them the hard truth, he told them what they wanted to hear. He made sacrifice. They sat down and feasted. And then they began to revel. A strong leader might have made a difference here. But back up on the mountain, our scripture continues. The Lord said to Moses, Go down at once. Your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have acted perversely. They have been quick to turn aside from the way that I have commanded them. They have cast for themselves an image of a calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, how stiff-necked they are. 
Now let me alone, so that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them. And I will make a of you a great nation. Wow. God is angry. God is angry. And he's just told Moses, look, I am going to destroy these these sinful and stiff, stubborn and stiff-necked people. They, this is, this is, too much. And instead, I'll keep my promise to Abraham by making a nation out of you, a descendant of Abraham, and I'll make that nation that will be that will be more numerous than the stars in the sky and the sands of the shore out of you and your descendants. And it is that nation that will be my special people and who will live in a land flowing in milk and honey that I will lead them to. That's quite an offer. Moses has sure had his headaches with the people. I'm half surprised that Moses, you know, I bet Moses was tempted to say, okay, okay with me, Lord, I'm sick of them too. But that's not what he did. Instead, good old Moses. But remember him back at the burning bush, he tried to think of every excuse in the world not to be their leader, not to be the one who was going to go back to Egypt and free the people. He said he couldn't speak. He said he couldn't do it. He said he, oh, he tried to make every excuse in the book. But God persisted, and finally Moses accepted and he took on that role, and once he took it on, he kept it. Oh, he lost his patience with the people too, we know that. But here in this moment, he's given a very important choice. And God allows him that choice. He said, you can stand back, and I will do and do and you can stand back and I will not hold it against you instead I will destroy that those those perverse and stiff-necked people and I'll make a nation of you and your descendants would have been a lot easier on Moses wouldn't it but that's not what Moses does instead exercising the free will that we've been given by God Moses says but Moses implored the Lord and said O oh Lord why does your wrath burn so hot against your people who you brought from the land of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that their God brought them out of the land of Egypt to kill them in the mountains and consume them from the face of the earth. Turn from your wrath. Change your mind. Do not bring disaster on your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, your servants, how you swore to them by your own self, saying, I will multiply your descendants like the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have promised I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. And the, and the Lord, the God of Israel, changed his mind about the disaster he planned to bring upon his people. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. What an important point in history in the history of the, of the ancient Israelites. They were about to be destroyed because of their own weakness and fear and willful disobedience. You know, I want to say, oh, how could they? They just, within the last 40 days, they had heard the voice of God speak and they had trembled and they had heard God give them the Ten Commandments in his own voice. How then could they, and all the powerful things that were happening, even as they were there at the foot of the mountain every morning, there was manna from heaven for them to gather. 
How could they lose faith? How could they fear and tremble and think that God would not take care of them and think that that God that it was okay to cast a, a calf and call it their God when he had told them he was not to be represented by any graven images. No, how could they think that? I want to say sh that's ridiculous. And like I said, I certainly understand why God said he would destroy them, threatened to destroy them. But, you know, we have a lot, I, I, those who live in glass houses should not throw stones. You, I've shared with you many times off and on over the years about my own struggles with faith in my life, in my, uh, in my journey through life. I was raised in a good Christian family. I was taught all the right things. I knew all the right answers to my good old catechism. Who is God? God is a supreme being. Where is God? God is everywhere. Why did God make me? God made me to know him, to love him, to serve him, and to be happy with him in heaven. I memorized, oh, so many, just like so many of you did. I didn't mem memorize much Bible verses because I was raised in a different tradition. And, as a Roman Catholic, but uh, I knew the Bible. I knew the Bible stories. I knew all the history of the Bible. I studied the Bible, though I didn't read the Bible personally. Uh, I would hear it proclaimed in bit, you know, parts four, four scripture readings every single Sunday. And in the three years, I heard most of the Bible read from the from the uh, from the pulpit. And I had wonderful parents and a loving family. But still, I rebelled in my teens and in my, well, I waited a little bit longer to rebel, but I did rebel. And I turned away from God and I blamed him for all the problems I had in my life, though I had made rash judgments and poor decisions and chosen to disobey. I saw him as distant and I was afraid of him. I thought about this God who would be up on the top of a mountain with, with, with lightning and clouds and power and smoke and fury, and it would threaten to destroy a people, and I just hoped to stay off his radar. Well, then I ran into crises in my life. My first marriage failed. My father died at the same time. My son, Michael, I didn't know he had Asperger's back then, but, but he was three or four years old and I knew something was wrong and everything was falling apart. So I threw myself with a frenzy into working for the church, into trying to do, tick all the boxes of things that were supposed to be uh, holy, supposed to make me better, supposed to make me a good Catholic or a good Christian. And I thought if I ticked all the boxes and worked, volunteered on this committee and went to that retreat and did this and did that, then God would automatically fix my life. I did that for about a year. Guess what? It was no mat. God did not step in and magically fix my life. Turns out I had some real problems I needed to deal with, but I didn't want to deal with those. I wanted the easy fix. I want to throw in a prayer, get a result. But it doesn't work that way. No, it really doesn't. But, so then I decided, well, fine, God didn't want to help me. I didn't need him. I wouldn't ask him for anything. He wouldn't tell me what to do. Uh, I'd go into a sort of don't ask, don't tell relationship with God. You've heard me say this before. How foolish is this? But I did, and I then willfully disobeyed so many of his commandments. 
and I went drifted far away from him. But all in my life, there was people. There were people who cared about me, and I want to talk about one of those, and people who prayed for me. But the one I want to talk about particularly is Nancy. Nancy was my housekeeper when I was a child, and she stayed close to our family and continued to work through me for me once in a you know once a week, through all of my adult life. And because I wanted to keep that connection with Nancy, and I knew she was retired now, and she needed the money, and and uh, we used to have breakfast together when she'd come once a week, and then we, she, uh, I had, I had halfway cleaned the house, but I didn't want to do it too good because she liked to vacuum, and she liked to to wash clothes, and so she would do that, and I'd always leave after we had a nice long visit, and and uh, so that she could and come back in the afternoon, late afternoon because I knew she took a nap. <laughs> but Nancy loved me and Nancy saw me in this time of making all those mistakes. And finally when I met my, uh, my second husband and he was trying to court me and I wasn't having anything to do with it but I finally broke down and gave him and said I'd go out on three dates with him and he was coming to pick me up for lunch for the first date. Nancy was there. Nancy spent five minutes with him, cornered me in my bedroom before I'd even come out. She didn't know any that he was even going to be a man picking me up. But I'll never forget the words she said. She said, Kathy, I have been praying for God to send you a good man. And I've looked into this man's eyes, and I know that this is the man that God sent you in answer to my prayers. So I know your mother's going to think he's too old for you. Chuck was 25 years older than I was. But that doesn't matter. You marry this man because he will love you and take care of you until the day he died, dies, and God has sent him to you. Well, I thought she'd lost it. But as it turned out, of course, we did fall in love. We did get married. And they were the best 10 years of my life until he died of can lung cancer. And God used that time to speak to my heart and his heart. Both of us had drifted from him to bring us close to him and closer to each other. And from that, of course, time came my call to ministry. I was ready to care for people spiritually in addition to physically and emotionally. You see, Nancy, like Moses, prayed for me when I didn't even know, wasn't willing to admit I needed prayers. There were other people praying for me, I'm sure, and it was only by the power of prayer, of that intercessory prayer, that I was saved, I suppose that I was spared a life of foolish, stiff-necked, stubborn, perverse behavior. See, Moses prayed for them while he was still up on the mountain. Oh, when he came down the mountain, he was upset. And even though he already was told what they're doing, when he saw it, he was so upset, he smashed the tablets of, that, that God had written with his own hands. But the point is, is Moses prayed for them. He stood in the breach, as they say. He stood there. He faced God and he said, please, God, think of, please don't do this. Don't you know what the, what the enemies of, the, of Israel will say, what the Egyptians will say? Oh, we brought them out there only to annihilate them. It'll reflect on you. And he, he prayed. He praised him for all that he had already done and for all that he had promised to do. And he begged him to spare the people. And God did. Nancy and others prayed for me. And God showed me a new path. I'm sure that you were praying for people. 
and that there are people who have prayed for you when you didn't even know you needed prayer. And it amazes me that prayer can do so much, but it can. It can do so much. And I hope you will remember the power of prayer. It's a wonderful privilege that God has given us, that we who were mere mortals, that in the spiritual realm, the prayers we have can make a difference. What a gift that is. I, don't, I know I don't appreciate it as fully as I should, because what a wonderful thing that God would allow me the spiritual, the power to have spiritual influence through the words that I pray. Let us never take that lightly. Let us continue to pray for all those who we are concerned about because the prayers of the faithful we are promised in the scripture are powerful and effective. And let us in turn thank God for the people who prayed for us and stood in the breach when we, know, when we needed it, whether we knew it or not. Amen. Let us affirm our faith together by reciting the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, crucified, died, and was buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of the Father Almighty, and from thence he shall come again to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Immediately following my benediction, we will have the Mormon Tabernacle Choir singing, It is well with my soul. And I pray that it is indeed well with your soul. And I just want to thank God for my role as your chaplain. I want to ask his strength to guide me and to be an effective resident advocate in the new role I'm taking on. And I really want to pray that it will be well with our souls in times of when peace flows like a river or whether the storms of life surround us. And until next time, may the blessings of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit descend upon you and remain forever. Amen.